Sometimes when people come to uh, the religious path or to a spiritual path, they see how extraordinarily important this is, how compelling the practice is. But sometimes the more that they give themselves to meditation, to uh, attending talks and programs in their local dharma center or at a temple, the more it seems to alienate them from their, their daily life, from their families, from their professions, from their social life. And so very often people end up feeling more confused and, and, and more troubled than when they started. And often the people around them wish they had never found that path in the first place. So I think that this is due to a basic misunderstanding of what the spiritual life is all about. In Buddhism, this can be especially prevalent because there is the tendency to overemphasize, no, you can't overemphasize, but to especially emphasize the role of meditation and the role of study. Meditating, studying religious texts, going to the temples, doing pujas, doing prostrations, listening to teachers. This is dharma. Everyday life with your family, going to work, mixing with your, your peers, that's just mundane samsaric activity. So what happens when we have this kind of mind frame is that we become increasingly to resent our families, our jobs, even our friends who are not dharmic friends. So this is the result of not really understanding what dharma is all about. And that's what we're going to discuss this morning. If you take the whole path, and here we will just take the path. There are many ways of categorizing the paths. Here we will take the path as exemplified in the, the six paramita or the six perfections. Now, what do we have? We have generosity. We have ethics. We have patience. That's a good one. <laughs> we have effort. Because without effort, nothing is ever accomplished. 
meditation and then wisdom, understanding this intelligence which comes through our meditation. Now, meditation is only one, right? Think about it. Meditation is only one. What about the other five? And those other five, if you consider generosity, ethical conduct, patience, and effort, and especially those first three, really require a social setting. They require other beings on whom to practice. It's really quite difficult to practice giving and ethics and patience in solitude because it comes naturally. There's no challenge. But these qualities which are essential, essential for the spiritual path and for enlightenment require a social setting in which to be perfected. Right? So, with our families, in our professions, in our social life, we can constantly be creating the causes for giving generosity. Generosity doesn't just mean giving things, although it does mean giving things. Giving things, especially things which we like. It's very easy to give our old clothes to charity and feel generous. But how about something which we are wearing and somebody really admires it? How about just saying, have it? Because we like it. And so we're giving something which we like, which we ourselves want to others. Because generosity opens up the heart. And I think this is why the Buddha put it at the beginning, that quality of open-handedness really opens up the heart. It's the key. And this is something which we can all practice during our daily life. You know? It's not just giving things. It's giving yourself. It's giving time. If people have problems listening, if your children need you being there, if your partner needs you being there, it's this quality of really thinking of others' needs instead of always our own needs. And that begins to really open us up. And then there's ethics. Well, ethics in this modern world are so needed. I mean, we will go for it very quickly, but of course, Buddhist ethics have to do with, basically, with non-harming. So the first one, which is most obvious, is not to harm in the sense of not killing. Because the thing which is most precious to any being in this world, not just human beings, but animals, fish, insects, the most precious thing which any of us possess is our life. And therefore, to deprive any being of its life is a very serious thing. So that comes first, to really live so that in this world, any be being in your presence knows that it is safe, that you will not harm it. The second principle is not taking that which is not given, which is a little more than just stealing, but here we will treat it as being stealing. Because why? Because again, if someone takes something from us without asking, we are hurt. During the, um, the time of the 60s and 70s, when, um, during that sort of whole hippie period, when people were very loose, people got also very loose about other people's possessions. 
and their feeling was, well, nothing is possessed by anybody, so therefore it's all mine, basically. And they would really, literally get very, very upset if someone took something of theirs, but they had no compunctions whatsoever about taking other people's property, saying that property should be owned by all. And this caused a lot of trouble, because for better or worse, we have our possessions and we want to keep them. And if we want to give them away, we will give them away. We don't need that other people should come and just help themselves without asking. And this also includes loans. We lend somebody something and then they don't give it back, especially books. Have you ever noticed books? <laughs> Abandon hope when you lend anyone a book. And not just that giving back what someone has given you, but also treating the proper, their, their property while one has it more precious than if it was one's own. Handing it back at least as, in as good a condition as we received it. Being conscientious. It all has to do with this quality of considering others beyond ourselves, which helps to clear away this, this tight hold on the ego, this self-cherishing mind, which is always seeing things from the point of view of what's in it for me. Right? So this quality of, of not taking anything which belongs to others without their express permission. The third one is sexual misconduct, ha. Huh? <laughs> and again, this is based really on a question when you get down to the essentials. It's again based on the quality of non-harming. Not performing any kind of sexual activity which could possibly have unfortunate repercussions for anyone, including ourselves. That's all. So it means adultery, because if we have sexual relations with someone else's partner, or if we are unfaithful to our own partner, it causes pain. It causes anguish. It causes jealousy and insecurity. And then any other kind of sexual activity which we indulge in should be done with a sense of responsibility and of regard for future consequences, not merely giving in to the impulse of the moment. We should think, where could this lead? What could be the results of this? I mean, we all know a lot. I mean, you take any famous people or ordinary people, including, you know, politicians and whatever, what is their downfall? I mean, it's so pathetic. <laughs> Hasn't anybody thought of anything new? <laughs> you know, it's, it's power and sex and money, always. Because they are, don't think of the consequences. They have no sense of res inner responsibility. They're just this momentary gratification. So we have to grow up. Children are like that. Children act impulsively. They don't think about what this will um, lead to, what the consequences will be. They want to do something, they do it. But when we become adults, we should have a wider vision. We, we should be masters of our own minds, our own emotions. And think about what's happening, what, what the consequences of our actions are going to be. Not just what is going to give us more pleasure in this moment. That is very, very childish. The fourth precept is about speaking the truth. But it's not just speaking truth, it's speaking also words which are helpful and which are kind. There are people who 
pride themselves on speaking the truth, but often the truth which they are speaking is very negative. And they see the faults in everything and speak about that. And they say, but, you know, I'm being honest here. But that is really not from the root of truthfulness, it's from the root of, um, of anger, really. So our truth should be truthful. Certainly our speech has to be truthful because people should know that what we say, they can trust us. Again, it's not harming people by trying to deceive them, by trying to cheat them. People know if we tell them something, then to the best of our possible knowledge, this is true. They can rely on us. But at the same time, our truth should be a truth which is helpful to people, which doesn't hurt them. And then how the fifth one is alcohol. And of course, everybody, even the most virtuous, says, ah, but a little wine with dinner. <laughs> like, well, just killing one or two people, but not wholesale slaughter, that's okay, you know. <laughs> just stealing a little bit, you know, not too much. The reason why the Buddha mentioned alcohol is because in the Buddha Dharma, we are striving constantly towards more and more mental clarity, towards really being here now, to seeing things as they really are, right? We are trying to become masters of our own mind instead of the slaves the slaves to our emotions, the slaves to our opinions and our ideas. We are trying to really understand the mind and become the master instead of the slave. To be really in control of the situation here. And so therefore, alcohol and drugs are counterproductive. Then we get patience. Patience has two sides to it. One is dealing with the patience of just dealing with the difficulties that we are bound to encounter in this realm of birth and death. So that, that quiet endurance when things are, you know, when it's too hot, when it's too cold, when things are not so comfortable, when things are difficult, that equanimity of mind which isn't, you know, terribly happy when everything's well and then totally depressed when things don't go the way we want it. But that sense of, of being able to just deal with anything which happens with a, a quiet, contented mind. That's a great strength. The Buddha said that patience was the greatest tapasya. Tapasya is normally those kind of um, austerities and, and hardships which, um, particularly in, in the Hindu uh, tradition, some uh, people go in for, like standing with your, your hand in the air or standing on one foot or um, sitting in the midst of five f fires and this type of thing. This is called tapasya or like in Christianity where they flagellate themselves and wear hair shirts, tapasya. And the Buddha said, forget all those. The greatest tapasya is patience, is this forbearance, this ability to endure. To endure when it's too hot or it's too cold or there are too many mosquitoes or whatever, just to have a mind which is not, not shaken by these things, which is able to be quite happy, whatever the external conditions may be. 
This is very important in Dharma practice and in everyday life. The other kind of patience uh, has to do, of course, with dealing with anger. We're dealing with this quality of when things irritate us and upset us, people irritate and upset us. To again have a mind which is equanimous. Shantideva points out very rightly that because patience is such an important component on the path <laughs> which we really need to learn and develop, we can only learn patience when we have circumstances and people who test that patience. You see, if we are always surrounded by people who are very kind to us, very loving to us, who do and say all the things we want them to do or say, that's very lovely, but we don't learn anything. It's very easy to love people who are lovable. That doesn't require anything. But to really love people who are obnoxious, <laughs> now that's something. And so therefore, those people who really push all our buttons, those are our greatest spiritual friends. Because with them, we can really learn, we can really develop. Do you understand? Two people experiencing the same thing, one can end up so angry, so bitter, the other can end up with genuine understanding and compassion. The same circumstances, but a different attitude of mind. It's all the mind which counts. And all these, these qualities we are talking about are for transforming our mind. And so our daily life that we are living is for transforming our mind. Do you understand? It's not enough just to sit for meditation for half an hour, an hour, two hours a day, and then the rest of the day your, your mind is doing its usual thing and running off and chattering and remembering past things and anticipating future things and getting caught up in fantasies and opinions and ideas without any awareness there. So the other one, which is, because um, I don't have infinite time here, is effort, because this is what we're talking about here. We have to make an effort. We have to try from our side. And what we have to try to do is to use every, everything which happens to us in our daily life, and especially in our relationships, as a way of purifying and transforming the mind and opening up the heart. Sometimes, you know, what happens, especially for Westerners, is that we did not grow up with the Dharma. It's not a part of our, our blood, so to speak. So we came to it usually because we read a book or we met someone, or we went to a talk, something like this. So what it means is that basically we came to it in the beginning through our intellect, through our heads. And then in order to understand it, we go and we, we visit many Dharma centers, we listen to many talks, we read many books, and we struggle to understand. But it's all up here. So the problem is to bring it from up here, down here, right? The problem is to really open up and move the heart. The heart has to be totally involved. Otherwise, there's no transformation. It stays up in our head, and if somebody says something we don't like, whoosh, all this anger comes out, same as ever. 
Nothing's really changed. I mean, we can spend... <sighs> I know, I speak from experience here. I mean, one can spend years and years and years in retreats or studying the texts or visiting all the great lamas of taking hundreds, if not thousands, of initiations. We've done it all, we've seen it all, we know it all. But down here, nothing's really changed. We're the same people. But just with a more inflated idea of what great Dharma practitioners and students we are. And so this is the problem. How to transform our Dharma knowledge into a food which really nourishes us. It's no good just learning the menu by heart. We have to eat it, and then we have to digest it, and then it has to go through and nourish every cell of our being so that we become it, right? In the traditional Buddhist uh, scheme, we start by what is called hearing, which means we start by studying, by reading, by listening. We absorb it first. We have to know. Then there's the thinking about, the pondering, all right? You hear something or you read something, you don't just accept it. You go away and you think about it. Its implications, what does it mean? If we have doubts, we go and we ask questions of someone who we hope knows more than we do. We think about it, we really, you know, but then we have to become it. We have to, uh, it's called uh, meditating or cultivating. It, it's when you sit down and you absorb yourself into that and then you try to really make it a part of your being. Not just up here. And that's the difficult part. And that's why we need our daily life as our practice field. Because it is a practice. And, and so we need our family, our children, our partners. We need those activities which we do during the day as a means of really understanding and cultivating these qualities. And one of the most important qualities which we need to develop in order to transform is that of awareness, of being absolutely present in the moment. In all Buddhist schools, and not just in Buddhism, in Christianity, in Hinduism, in Islam, in any spiritual, genuine spiritual path, there is always this quality of being present. However, the methods devised for becoming present, there are many in the different spiritual paths, but the aim is to be here and now, to know. Now, because normally we are everywhere except really actually in the present, although we think we're in the present, we think, well, that's no problem, that's easy. I'm always here. But when we start to practice, we begin to realize, I mean, usually the first realization is, is appalling of how totally we are not here, how totally we are not present with what is actually happening in the moment, how much we are caught up in our ideas and our judgments and our thoughts and our memories and our comparisons and our fantasies and daydreams and all these things about what is happening. But not what is happening in itself. I mean, even when we eat, even when we eat, right? Now we're eating something we really like. And so we take the first bite, 
And with that first bite, immediately comes our opinion. You know, oh, yes, this is great. Oh, it's not as good as what we had last week somewhere else. Oh, you know, da, 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 I like it, I don't like it. So already you're no longer experiencing it. You're just experiencing your ideas about it. But at least you're still focused on the food, sort of. But by the second or the third bite, where are we? We're no longer thinking about what we're eating. We're talking about this, or we're thinking about that, or we're thinking about what we're going to have for dessert. But we're not experiencing anymore what we are doing, what we are eating. So even with something pleasurable, we cannot keep our mind on what we're doing. So what to speak of ordinary everyday activities? Do you understand? This is really very important. There are two things here. First is to become aware of what we are doing. Um, the Buddha said that when we are walking, we know we are walking. When we are sitting, we know we are sitting. When we are standing, we know we are standing. When we are lying down, we know we are lying down. And he was very, this is how he starts the discourse on, on being present, on mindfulness. Because our body is something very gross, and we, we can know it without too much problems. But when we are standing, when we are walking, when we are lying down, do we know we are doing this? Normally we are not even conscious of what our body is doing. We've forgotten it. Often we've even forgotten where we are, because our mind is off in some completely other place, in some completely other space. And this wouldn't matter if we only did it from time to time. But we do it continually. We are almost never actually present in the moment. And when we start to try to be present in the moment, we realize how extraordinarily difficult this actually is. Which means that we're always living somewhere else. We're never here and now. And then time seems to go by so quickly, and then suddenly we're old, and we think, what happened to my life? When you are young, you don't think that's going to happen. But it happens very quickly, let me assure you. And we think, well, where did that go? There is a Zen master called Thich Nhat Hanh. And he talks. Uh, about many things, but one of the things he talks about is this question of being present. And so he talks about washing dishes to wash dishes. So therefore he says, why not wash the dishes just to wash dishes? In other words, when we are washing the dishes, know that we are washing the dishes. Feel the water, feel the bubbles. Just know that's what we're doing. And wash the dishes just because what could be more wonderful than just to sit and watch this? That's what we're doing. You see, that's the only th reality there is. Everything else is just our memories, our anticipations. The only thing which actually is there is what we are doing in this very moment. And if we miss that because our minds are somewhere else, it's gone. Do you understand? And if we are really present, really present in that moment of doing whatever we are doing, such as washing dishes or whatever, our minds are also washed. Everything becomes very clear, very vivid. It's like we wake up. We're asleep, and suddenly we wake up. We're here. This is what's happening in this moment. And the mind is present with what is happening in this moment, which is th as it really is. Otherwise, it, it's just uh, we're living in, in daydreams. 
Do you understand? And we live our whole life like this. And when you try to be mindful, you realize how difficult it is because, you know, you start washing the dishes and then you're thinking, oh, this is easy. Look, I'm really present now. This is really nice. So you're not present anymore. You're just thinking about being present. Right? You're just, again, chatter, chatter, chatter. It's not so easy just to really have that point of total attention. But once one begins to get it, then what happens is that there is this quality within us of knowing. Normally, when we think, when we remember, when we anticipate, when we are happy, sad, angry, joyful, enthusiastic, disheartened, disappointed, hopeful, we are submerged in those feelings. We are identified with those feelings. Right? We are the happiness, we are the sorrow. We are our depressions and our hopes. And it's like we're, we're caught in the middle of, of an ocean. You know, it's, it's all these waves of emotions and opinions and judgments and ideas and memories. They roll over us and toss us up and down. And we believe in them. They are so solid. They are so real. This is who I am. We are totally identified with these feelings and thoughts and opinions and memories, our ideas about who we are, our nationality, our gender, our family, our background, our childhood. This is me. And we are completely immersed in this. And totally like this with our sense of identification and clinging to this sense of identification. So we suffer. We suffer because in that kind of mind we are tossed up and we are tossed down like waves in the ocean. So today I'm happy, tomorrow something happens and I'm miserable. And that's me. So it's very insecure, and very often it's very, very painful. But behind all that, there is that which knows. There is this quality in our mind of awareness, of knowing. If we weren't conscious, we would be like a corpse. So moment to moment to moment, we actually are aware. We are just not aware that we are aware. So what we need to learn to do is to identify with the knower and not with the known. The known is transitory. The known is the waves on the ocean. The known are the clouds in the sky. But they are not the sky. Clouds come in the sky. Black clouds, white clouds, fluffy clouds, thunderous clouds. They exist within the sky, but they are not the sky. So what we need is to learn how to recognize and, as it were, identify with the sky-like nature of the mind, which is behind and supporting and, and underlying all the thoughts and emotions, but is not the thoughts and emotions. Do you understand? This is very important.
There is that quality in our mind which witnesses, which observes, which knows. Normally we are not conscious of it because we are so totally absorbed in our thoughts and ideas and memories and daydreams. But we can stand back and see the thoughts and the emotions and the memories and the daydreams as just mental states, impermanent mental states which arise, last for a moment and disappear. They are not me, they are not mine. When we learn to recognize and abide more and more within the knower instead of the known, then there comes this liberation of the mind. And we can use our daily life to help us to begin to do this. The doorway to this, the doorway to liberation of the mind is through this awareness. This innate primal awareness which is the ground of our nature. And one step, a very important step towards beginning to connect with this and, and to uh, stabilize this uh, ability to be with the known, to be with the knower rather than just with the known, is through this mindfulness, this awareness connected with the body, what the body is doing, what the breath is doing, the ingoing, the outgoing of the breath, because it anchors us to the here and now. And as we become more and more conscious in the moment, and seeing our thoughts and feelings and opinions and ideas and memories and anticipations just as that, as peripheral, not as central to our being, then we also begin to get this inner space and this inner center. It's not enough, although it is important, to mm, sit for meditation half an hour or an hour every day. Yes, this is very important, but just that will never achieve an inner transformation. We have to carry that awareness, that, that, that sense of presence into whatever we are doing in the moment. Really, honestly, you can, we can be talking, we can be drinking, we can be working, and we can just be doing that, or we can know we are doing that. And in the moment of that knowing it, it's like everything, it's like this unfocused camera suddenly becomes into focus. It's a whole shift in our inner psychic world. It's unmistakable. Not thinking about being present, not thinking about being aware, but just being aware, just knowing, this naked knowing, this naked seeing. Usually when we start, we can only do it just for you know, a few moments, and then we, we are thinking about it again. Oh, wow, this is great. Yeah, look, now I'm really aware. And, of course, we've already lost it, right? doesn't matter. Then, next time, we just perk up the mind. One of my teachers here, one, one of our yogis, used to say, well, every hour, try, you know, maybe 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, just to remember. Just, just even for a few seconds to perk up the mind, just for a moment, what is happening in this moment, knowing it, what the body is doing, what the mind is doing, just seeing, without comment, without judgment, just in that, just for a moment to know it. And then gradually, as we begin to do it more and more, the mind begins to understand and the quality of our awareness and the ability to um, elongate those moments of, of inner spaciousness and knowing 
begin to get longer and longer and more and more frequent, we begin to spontaneously suddenly zap into being absolutely knowing, suddenly. It doesn't look outwardly like anything's changed, but inwardly everything has suddenly changed. And then those moments get more and more frequent and a little bit longer and longer until in the end they all join up. Then we are in a, a state of total rigpa, we're enlightened. But in the meantime, even a few moments of really being present, of really being absolutely centered in this inner spacious awareness uh, can transform our lives because we see, we see very, very clearly how much everyone, including ourselves, are totally caught up in our thoughts and emotions. That's all we experience. Do you understand this? We do only experience the outer world through our senses and our sense consciousnesses, which then, through our perception, interpret it to us. If we had a different set of senses, we would perceive the world quite differently. And then how we interpret that to ourselves is what we experience. So we only ever experience our own mental content. Do you understand? Therefore, it's essential that we learn how to really clarify and clean up our inner landscape, because that's all we have, really. Because it's everything which we experience is colored by our own mental content. And that's what we experience, not the external reality, what is a reality. The only reality we can ever know is, is that which is interpreted to us through our senses and through our mental contents. So if our minds are completely unruly and wild, then all we're going to experience is, is outer chaos and problems. If our inner world is, is structured and spacious and open and clear, then there's no problems outside. The problem isn't out there, the problem is in here, right? If we experience hell realms, it's because the hell realm is within our own mind. So therefore, it's really important to use our relationships. I mean, where better to cultivate compassion and loving kindness and patience and giving then amongst one's own family, with one's own partner, with the people one meets every day. Where else? You know, we talk about may all sentient beings be well and happy, but who are these sentient beings? Right? They're not these beings out there on the horizon somewhere. They're the person that's right in front of you right now. That's the person. And so every single being that we meet, including bank agents and, and government officials and whoever, may you be well and happy. Right? These are our, our field of, of understanding and of practice. Where else? So every breath we take, Every thought that we think, every step which we take, can be a way of really treading the spiritual path, if we are conscious. If we are conscious, then everything we do, every single word we speak, is a way of really beginning to come closer and closer to reality. Do you understand? We should be very happy because our happiness or our sorrow depends entirely on ourselves. Doesn't depend on anything going on out there. We are totally responsible. We go up or we go down. It's up to us in totally, nobody else. So everything is in our own hands and that's wonderful, isn't it? You know, nobody's stopping us from transforming our heart. No one's stopping us from being peaceful and happy. 
Who is stopping us? We are stopping ourselves. We are standing in our own, in the sunlight of our own reality and saying how dark it is. So we should step out from our own light. Can you please explain the relationship between master and disciple and how does it work? Especially for somebody who wants to be under a master from a foreign country where there are no masters or teachers. If you can meet with a master who is genuinely qualified and with whom you can have a deep and intimate relationship and experience his guidance, then that is the absolute most perfect best. There is no disputing it. If you are going in a wild, uncharted land, full of swamps and precipices and misguiding paths, the presence of a guide who really knows where they're going is an enormous benefit. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. So that we will state right from the start. However, nowadays there are many, many beings who set themselves up to be masters. And whether or not they are qualified so to be, it's very difficult to know because some of them are very charismatic, very fascinating, they speak very well, very witty. Some of them are, are placed up very high by their culture. How do we know? It is very difficult sometimes, truly it is very difficult to know who is really motivated by wisdom mind and who is motivated by an inflated ego. You can't always tell. And as the Tibetans say, if you find a false master, then disciple and master hand in hand jump over the chasm. The other problem is that this whole question of master-disciple relationships came about, for example, in India, where and at the beginning in Tibet also, where you would have a, a master and then um, you know, a few disciples would come, he would test them, often by saying that he knew nothing and go away, he was just a scraggy old sadhu. And they would persist and they would keep coming, they would serve him. And then sometimes it took years, you know, they served him, he looked at them, they looked at him, and eventually there came this time when they mutually committed themselves to the relationship. And then they would receive the initiations and the teachings and the practice and have the guidance of this teacher whom they totally trusted. But nowadays, even if we meet an enlightened master, what do we see of him? I mean, most of the enlightened as well as the unenlightened masters are whizzing around the world. They're jet-setting everywhere. You know, so they come to your town, they're there for two days, they give all these initiations, they sit up on a high throne, they look absolutely dazzling. You think, ah! But then he's gone. Who knows when he's ever coming back? And how are you going to have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship like that? And if one lives in, in countries where there are very few masters, the very most one would uh, hope for was that event, uh, you know, occasionally someone would flash by. So it's very difficult. Now, it can happen. Having said that, okay, 
We take the example of, say, the Mahasiddhas who lived around the 8th or 9th century in India. Some of them, they were just ordinary people with a problem. Sound familiar? And they happened to meet by some, some wandering monk or some sort of sadhu character who was, you know, in those days everybody walked, they didn't go in Mercedes. And so they stopped the night and they told him their problem and he gave them a practice to do. And then next morning he left. But they carried on that practice. They incorporated that practice with their daily life and they attained realizations. So what I'm saying is it not necessarily always the case that you need to be constantly in the presence of the master. If you have really a heart connection, then it doesn't really matter where the master is. Because if he's a realized, genuinely enlightened master, the moment you think about him, he is there for you. Truly. This is true. The other thing which I have to say is that we should not wait for the time when we're walking along a mountain path and suddenly we meet this being who says, ah, I have been waiting for you. Why did it take you so long? <laughs> right? I mean, I know people like that. I know people who are waiting for, to meet the perfect master we know, right, Preeta? Who is going to say the word and zap his fingers and he's going to get it. And in the meantime, there's no point in making any effort. Because if he was a perfect master, wouldn't he just want to enlighten you? Right? So again, we shouldn't use waiting for a master to put off what we can do now. Every teacher we meet, every person who has some special qualities is our teacher. We can learn. There are myriad books. There are myriad people giving talks. We can learn. And we, if we are really sincere, then as we need guidance, it will come. It won't necessarily, usually doesn't come in the form we're expecting. But it will be there if we are really sincere. And we should always remember that the ultimate guru is our own wisdom mind. So ultimately, any true master is trying to bring the disciple back to their own inherent wisdom. I mean, I would be very suspicious. A guru is like a mother. And so a mother, when the child is very small, says, do this, don't do that. Every time the child needs something, they run to mummy. But when they grow up, if the mother still wants them to run to mummy, if they can't leave mummy, that they can't make any decision without asking mother first, there is something seriously wrong. A good mother loves her child and brings up her child to be independent of mother. And a good guru brings up a disciple to discover their own innate wisdom, which we all have. And any guru who 20 years down the line still has his disciples running to him all the time saying, Rinpoche, should I do this? Rinpoche, should I do that? Something's wrong. Frankly. I mean, my own Lama, at the beginning, I would always say, Rinpoche, what should I do? What should I do? But pretty way down the line, he'd say, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> and in the end, I was saying, Rinpoche, I was thinking to do this or that. And then, you know, he'd usually say, yeah, that's great. You know, I'll get the teachings here or there. I mean, he would give. But I was not always running to ask him what to do. I was just, I decided what to do. And I just confirmed with him because, you know, he understood. He could know me better than I knew myself. 
So I wanted to confirm that I was going in the right direction. Obviously, he was the guide, but he wasn't holding me by the hand the whole time, and no true guru will do that. He doesn't need his disciples to boost him up. He doesn't need to surround himself with a group of yes men. The spiritual path is to discover our own inner wisdom and any master, anybody we meet, we can learn from them. Even people who are detrimental to us, we can learn from them. And in this way, we can begin to uncover and rediscover our own true wisdom mind and that is the true master. When I was 11 years old, I was in a car accident that killed my mother and since then, I've lived a life that revolves around bitterness and anger. And my question is, when so much of my identity is trapped back there, um, how do I find peace? How do I let go of my attachment to the loss of my mother? From the point of view of what we were talking about this morning, from that viewpoint, then you know already the answer. We are not our memories. We are not, I mean, memory is just a thought. It's not a thing, right? Do you understand? You see, normally when we think me, then immediately there's this parcel of identifications. I am female, I am male, I am Australian, American, European, Tibetan, Indian, Nepali. I am an intelligent person. I have always been really stupid. I had a wonderful childhood. I had a terrible childhood. I'm always a, a quite a, a confident, easygoing sort of person. I'm a tortured, difficult, miserable sort of person. Doesn't matter what our identification is. It's still that we are clinging to something which is very temporary. It's like if you're an actor. I mean, this is a little bit Hindu idea, but still. It has some validity. If you're, if you're an actor and you're playing a part, and so you're playing, the, you know, you're playing some Shakespearean tragedy or some comedy, and while you're the actor, to be a good actor, you have to identify with the character to play the part as well as you can. So you're playing the part and really putting yourself into it, really trying to understand the character, really getting into the role. But a wise actor, when he comes off the stage, understands that was just a role. It's not who he really is. In a minute we're going to do, there's a question about Tantra, and this will come up again, this whole question of false identification, because this causes us so much trouble. Because we, we cling so hard, even to things which hurt us. God, I mean, we, we are all here, we are all intelligent, we have all received a good education, we are all pretty healthy, we all have enough money to to feed ourselves, to clothe ourselves, we have some homes, we have everything that people, beggars in Bihar would die for. And yet we're still bloody miserable. Why? Because our mind will not allow us to be happy. We make ourselves happy, unhappy. Nobody is standing there saying, I'm going to make you miserable now. And yet still, because our minds are so uncontrolled, although we want so desperately to be happy, we do nothing but make ourselves miserable. 
And when we make ourselves miserable, we make everybody else miserable. We don't wake up in the morning saying, oh, I want to have a really horrible day today and make everybody else gloomy too. But still, you know, we wake up thinking, oh, if only I could be joyful today. So then why can't we? Because we cling. We cling, cling, cling. As I said last week, if there's one message in Buddhism, it's let go. Just let go. But we hold. Because of this, this fear, this, this sense of insecurity that if I let go of who I am, a miserable person with an unhappy childhood who had all these traumatic occurrences, I would be a non-person. I wouldn't be me anymore. And each one of us does this. To a greater or a lesser extent, we just cling, even to the things which make us miserable. We really are very stupid. <laughs> we think we're intelligent, but we are so dumb. Because all we have to do is let go. Nobody's making us miserable. We are making ourselves miserable. So I would suggest that you do some Vipassana courses. Let these feelings come up in an atmosphere where you can really look at them, see them just as sensations, see them just as thoughts and feelings. Don't identify with them and learn how to begin to let them go. Because they are not you. So why do you allow them to imprison you? Hmm? They're just thoughts, they're just memories, they're just just mental things coming into the mind. They're so boring. You've thought all these things a thousand times. Let it go now. You know? So give yourself some space to do that. Do some Vipassana courses. Uh, and, you know, allow yourself to cry. Allow yourself to allow these feelings to come up. But really see them for what they are. They are not you. Those things which happened then are finished now. You're not a little girl of 11 anymore. You don't have to carry those feelings with you. You can let them go. But only you can make that decision. Nobody can do it for you. Okay? Believe me. The moment you decide to do it, you're free. Nobody's imprisoning you. You're imprisoning yourself. Many people that I've experienced during both my working life and also in my personal life seem to have uh, an inherent lack of self-love or self-worth and because of that feeling they suffer from it. So my question is, how do you best help these people? The Dalai Lama says that one of the main differences which he's perceived between Westerners and Tibetans is that on the whole Tibetans kind of feel okay about themselves and most, so many Western people really hate themselves. He finds this really seriously weird. <laughs> And what is so sad is that it's often the nicest people who have the lowest self-esteem and the really obnoxious ones think they're great. <sighs> the Buddha taught loving-kindness, metta or maitri in Sanskrit. And when one practices maitri, or this sense of loving kindness. Loving kindness means the thought, may you be well and happy. You know, the difference between love and compassion is that love is saying, may you be happy, and compassion is saying, may you be free from suffering. Okay? So, this sense of may you be happy, may you be well within, this sense of really wishing well-being to beings has to start with oneself. Yeah? We cannot give love to others if we do not have love with our own heart, not genuine love. So we have to start by thinking to ourselves, may I be well and happy. May I be peaceful and at my ease. 
we have to have love for all sentient beings. We are also a sentient being. And we are the sentient being which we particularly have responsibility for. So therefore, we have to start with ourselves. We have to start with accepting and feeling at ease within ourselves, of really wishing ourselves to be happy, of really feeling compassion for ourselves. Do you understand? This is so important. When we have that feeling of warmth and acceptance towards ourselves in our heart, and we can feel it, then we are ready to give it out to others. It is not self-cherishing. It's something very different. Without, if we despise ourselves, if we think we are unworthy, we are cutting the roots of any genuine progress because we don't believe in ourselves. When I first met the Karmapa, I was in Calcutta and I was 21, 22. And within five minutes, he said to me, your problem is that you don't believe in yourself. You have no confidence. If you don't believe in yourself, who will believe in you? And of course, that was very true. And it is very true. If we don't believe in ourselves, how are we going to go on the spiritual path, which requires we are spiritual heroes? The, the path isn't for wimps. And to get that inner strength and that inner confidence and that inner courage, we have to be friends with ourselves. We can't be at war with ourselves. We can't undervalue ourselves the whole time. We all have Buddha nature. We all are inherently pure and wise and compassionate. It's just covered up, that's all. So we should have compassion for ourselves because of our ignorance and really nurture ourselves first so that we begin to trust ourselves, believe in our own potential. Feel, you know, okay, so I'm stupid. Okay, so I do silly things. Okay, so I get angry. Okay, so I get jealous. Well, I'm human. Never mind, other people do too. What is so special about me that I should be so perfect? If I was perfect, I wouldn't need the Buddha Dharma. So, you know, first we have to forgive ourselves and, and, and feel a kindness. I mean, if, if we were someone else, we would be kind to that person. So why not be kind to us when we're here? Hmm? And then with that sense of, of you know, of accepting who we are, it's only pride. It's a funny kind of pride. You know, in Buddhism, pride means thinking we're superior, thinking we're equal, thinking we're inferior. Because it's all based on ego. It's all based on ego. Even if you say, oh, God, I'm the world's worst sinner, that is extremely egoistic. <laughs> and so we by undercutting ourselves the whole time, you know, we, we devalue everything we do. And this, this is not spiritual. It's a mistake to think it's humility. It's not humility. Humility means no ego, no I to be proud. Right? That's humility. But thinking, oh, I'm so stupid, oh, I'm so unworthy, oh, I'm such a bad person, that is just ego. So be kind to ourselves. Just questions about Tantra. Uh, many publications, many teachers come in different countries, and now a little bit I feel confusion with this question. I'd like to ask Anila that uh, just her personal opinion about what is the essence of Tantra practice and what is the main difference with Sutra. Okay, Tantra. Well, my personal opinion is that Tantra is <coughs> to do with this whole question of pure and impure perception. 
impure perception is that we see things as being very solid. This is a table, that's carpet, that's grass out there, there's the sky, these are the people. Some of them are probably nice people, some of them are difficult people, but they're just people. Uh, you know, I'm just a person. That is our ordinary, unpurified perception, which sees everything as very ordinary nothing special, that associates things as being just, you know, just common and boring and ordinary, and I'm ordinary and boring and common and so is everybody else and what a drag life is. This is an impure perception. Pure perception means to realize that since the very beginning everything is in a state of pristine clarity and purity. Especially the beings inhabiting this earth. You see, we look at each other and we see Tibetan, Western, Indian, old, young, fat, thin, male, female, intelligent, meh. Um, and as we identify with ourselves, so we also identify with other beings. And again, this is our fundamental ignorance because we are not perceiving their innate Buddha nature. We are plugging in to this very ordinary way of relating with all beings, as being very ordinary. So the Tantra, you see, in the sutras, in the sutras, you start with the idea that we have the seed of Buddhahood. We have that Buddha potential. We all have that, that embryonic potential for perfection, for omniscience. And so, we have to water it, we have to cultivate it like a plant, and from the seed there comes a little sapling, and then it grows bigger and bigger into a plant, and then eventually it becomes this huge great tree of Buddhahood. And so we start as ignorant, ordinary beings, but through cultivating through the six perfections and going through all the bodhisattva levels, eventually our little seed will become this huge, great, great Bodhi tree. But this takes an awfully long time. It takes a long time to grow a Bodhi tree. And according to the sutras, it takes three and a half incalculable eons of time. Vast amounts of time. So then you get the feeling, yeah, why bother? My God, is it going to take that long, you know? Why not just enjoy ourselves, you know what I mean? What, what's the point? of striving, however hard I strive, it's going to take eons and eons of time. And then there was another approach which said, what we are seeking, we already have. We already are Buddhas. We just don't know it. So instead of seeing it from here and then going this way until we reach here, how about taking that, the fruit, and bringing it right back to here and now? And acting from that, acting from our Buddha potential, which we really have, but we just don't realize it. So then in the Tantra, one sees oneself as a divine being, one sees oneself as a Buddha or a Bodhisattva or one of the infinite numbers of divine beings. And one sees all other beings also in that form. In other words, one begins to clear away this very thick dust of our perception. So when, for example, we see ourselves, say, as, as uh, Chen Rezik, 
right? Chen Rezik, the Buddha of the Bodhisattva of compassion. You see, what happens usually is we are seeing ourselves, we sit there, right? And we visualize ourselves as white and shining, forearms adorned with silks and jewels, radiating lights. And we think, I am Fred Smith, and I am pretending to be Chen Rezik. <laughs> Maybe if I pretend hard enough, eventually something will happen. This is really a dumb practice, but my Lama told me to do it, so, oh, money pay me, oh, money pay me, oh, money pay me. Right? But we know we're Fred Smith. We're just pretending to be Chen Rezik. And that, that is our fundamental ignorance, our fundamental impure perception. Because the truth is that we are Chen Rezik. We're just pretending to be Fred Smith. <laughs> Do you understand? All the time, we are Chen Rezik. But through countless lifetimes, we take on countless forms until we finally come back to where we have never departed from. Do you understand? You see, this is our mistake. We always identify with the wrong thing. Our genuine nature is, is total wisdom and compassion and purity and power. That's who we really are. We've just forgotten. So we have to come back to where we have never left. And this is what Tantra is doing. It's trying to remind us who we are, who we always have been. It's not a game of pretend. It's the only reality we really have. It's the only time we're actually trying to come back into realizing the truth. And that's why it's very important during the day also to see oneself as the deity and to see all other beings as the deity because that is bringing us back to where we really should have never departed from. Do you understand? And because of that, when one is seeing oneself as who one truly is, one also performs the activities of a Buddha. One sends out lights to purify all beings, one makes offerings to infinite Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. That's our potential, that we could do that. And for this reason, if we really understand what we're doing, and blend our minds completely with the practice. Not this, oh, I'm just pretending, but anyway, let's try it. But really committing ourselves to the practice, really with great confidence. You see, in, in Tantra, the most important thing is what is called divine pride. Divine pride means that inner confidence that one is the deity, and all beings are the deity. Not just human beings, but insects, animals. All beings, all beings have that spark. And so then throughout the day, one sees that all beings have that innate potential. All sounds are really the sounds of the mantra. All thoughts which arise in the mind are just the play of the wisdom mind. They're not ordinary thoughts, good thoughts, bad thoughts. They're just wisdom thoughts because they come from our very profound an infinite wisdom mind. So then everything becomes a pure realm. Very quickly. Very, very quickly. If we really understand what we're doing and we blend our mind with the practice, then very quickly, because also these creative visualizations are not... Somebody didn't just sit down and write them. You know, this looks like a fun thing to do, like a film script. It came from the very depths of realized minds. These visualizations and these appearances of the deities are not arbitrary. It's not Walt Disney sitting and making a design. They, they come from the very depths of very, very realized beings. 
And by visualizing these, we connect with that wisdom mind and it accesses to very deep levels of our being very quickly in a way that words and conceptual thinking cannot do. These creative visualizations have a very deep repercussions on, on deep levels of, of our conscious and subconscious minds. And that's why these, these visualizations are not arbitrary. People say, well, we're Western people and all this stuff might be very good for Indians or Tibetans, but we're Westerners, we need Western looking deities. And so, okay, when a, a Westerner becomes so deeply realized that spontaneously they generate their own innate uh, visualizations, which are genuine visualizations, then maybe we can change. But in the meantime, you know, as I said, these are not arbitrary things. Nothing that they do is arbitrary. It all has a very profound inner repercussions. I mean, people say, well, we should visualize things which relate to our own culture. So what are you going to do? You know, Mickey Mouse in Yabion with Minnie Mouse, you know, with Donald Duck on one side and Goofy on the other as attendant bodhisattvas. <laughs> And, and saying, Om Coca-Cola Hom Pe. You know, I mean, okay, that's our, that's our culture. But the question is, did Walt Disney have innate wisdom realizations to generate this form of Mickey Mouse? Because where his mind came from when he thought of Mickey Mouse, that's where our mind will be led to. Do we want to become Walt Disney? This is what we have to ask ourselves. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying here? So although these, these visualizations are cultural, nonetheless, the wisdom mind from which they arose is not cultural, not really. It's, it's the universal mind. So even though the form of the bodhisattvas changes a little bit when it was in India, Tibet, China, Japan, changes a little bit. But the essential form remains the same. And this form is not arbitrary. Okay? But the most important thing is to understand that these forms are just a way of expressing something which is formless, of course, which goes beyond any form. It's a way of bringing our mind back because we cannot imagine the formless. So by using form, it begins to help us to access to levels of mind which reveal the formless.